And we are live once again for a cigar evening, a question and answer session with yours truly, Tristan the Talisman Tate. If you don't know how these things work, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. But what's going to happen essentially is this. All day, I've been going through a list of questions, questions about myself, about my life, uh, people looking for advice. And I have curated a list of questions, and I'm going to be answering them live as I smoke this exact cigar. Now, when the cigar is over, or when I decide like logging off, then the Q&A is over. If you do have questions while I'm doing this, you're free to send in super chats. But before you do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the kind of questions that I choose to answer. Also to stop people wasting their time and sending me nonsense questions. If you ask me a question personal about myself, like, Tristan, what is your favorite color? I may well answer that. It's a bit generic, but you understand the point. If you ask a question which I think the answer could apply to lots of people, like, Hey Tristan, I'm struggling with a breakup because of X reason or Y reason. I may well answer that. My last live stream, 1.5 million people so far have watched it. And I understand that a lot of people could benefit from hearing the answer. But if you ask me something super specific about advice for yourself, and I'm warning you because I had loads of super chats last time. I'm not going to answer it. Hey, Tristan, I'm 16 and a half years old and I'm working in a fish market in Mozambique. My dream is to become a circus juggler. What do you think? Don't fucking send me these stupid questions. Don't send me these stupid questions because I'm not going to reply because answering you and you specifically is not going to benefit the other 1.5 million people who will end up watching this stream. So keep your questions interesting. Keep your questions uh, concise or specific to me or general uh, about the public. And that way... Your question may get answered. So first I'm going to light this cigar and then I'm going to pick up my phone because this is not an emergency meeting. There is not Mr. Producer and sound effects and videos and photos popping up on the screen. It's just me with a live camera. I can see myself on my laptop here and I've got my phone with all of your questions coming through as we speak. So let me light my cigar first. I could have lit this before I started. But I feel like part of the charm of the cigar night is watching me like this. And last cigar evening, I didn't talk about soups or cigars. I thought people wouldn't want to hear that. But it turns out people do. So this is an Arturo Fuente cigar. And the most important thing to know about this particular cigar stick is that it was gifted to me by Steven Seagal. The 1980s action movie hero, Steven Seagal. That's right, the one and only. If you don't know who Steven Seagal is... Shame on you. But that's where this cigar comes from. And honestly, it's limited edition. It is one of the finest cigars I've ever smoked. Not just because it comes from Mr. Cigar, because it's actually a top quality product. So, Arturo Fuente's classic Cuban cigar brand. I'd highly recommend them. And if you can somehow meet Steven Seagal and he gives you a cigar, it's going to be an excellent one. But that probably won't happen to most of you. I have picked up my phone now, and I'm going to get to the first question. So, last time, a lot of people were upset that I didn't answer questions about my suits. So, I'm going to very quickly, before I moved on to the most asked question of this particular session, talk about my suits and the way I dress. Three years ago, I wore tailored clothing. Not as nice as the tailor clothing I wear now, because I changed tailor to the finest tailors in the world. Now, the finest tailors in the world are all on a single street in London called Savile Row. And my particular tailor shop has been open since 1849. They make suits for the, the King of England, royal family. But the reason people comment on my suits specifically, and not the King's suits, not members of Parliament suits, is for one particular reason. Now, three years ago, I was not in the best shape. I was dealing with some injuries. I had some rehabilitation issues. I didn't have my abs. I wasn't looking as jacked as I normally do. I, when I got into shape, noticed people complimenting my suits all the time. Because it's not actually the suit that you're complimenting. It's how I look in the suit. Plenty of millionaires, billionaires, rich people around the world probably get their suits made at the exact same tailor I do. But the reason I look so good in them 
is because I'm the type of guy who will wear a $10,000 suit, who will also put in the work and the effort every day to stay in good shape, to make sure I've got wide shoulders, to make sure I've got a slim waist, to make sure I've got abs, to make sure I've got pecs and, and biceps. That is the secret to looking good in one of my suits. So if you're young and you can't afford $10,000 for a suit, which a lot of you can't, I certainly couldn't when I was younger, my advice to you would be get into great shape, find a suit that fits, and make sure that you never get out of shape. Obviously, tailoring improves, fabric quality improves. It all does improve as you know your budgets go up. But being in shape, I think, is the cornerstone of why everyone compliments my suits. I could have this exact same outfit on if I was 100 pounds heavier and uh, fat, even if the suit was perfectly made for me, I don't think people would be complimenting me exactly the same. So keep that in mind. It's not the suit. It's not the suit that makes the man. And speaking of being in shape, I have to touch on this briefly because it was the single most asked question for this cigar meeting, which is Tristan Tate, um, what do you think of the recent contro uh, controversy about the liver king. And the liver king is obviously somebody who tries very, very hard to stay in shape. So it flows on perfectly from my last question. I'll tell you what I think about the liver king. And this answer may upset a few people. Because I'm sure a lot of you want me to sit here and you know, trash the liver king and drag his name through the dirt. He actually reached out to me about two weeks before the steroid um, proof was released when it was proven that he was in fact on steroids. Most people looking at him knew that, you know, people who look like that are on steroids. You have to be a, a very, very rare, exceptional freak of nature to look like that if you weren't on steroids. I got a message from him and he reached out to me saying that he was going to come to Dubai and we should do something together. The reason I didn't reply or, or get in touch or make anything happen us was not because I have anything against the liver king or had anything against the liver king at the time. It's because I didn't see how our brands complemented each other. He eats raw meat, you know, works out a lot, sleeps on hardwood floors, you know, tries to pitch this primal lifestyle. I like champagne and caviar and wear nice suits and don't walk around shirtless. I didn't see how we could collaborate in any way besides taking a few pictures together. So I never got together with the liver king. But... My thoughts on him are as follows. If you are a fan of the Liver King, your relationship with him and how you see how his content has changed you will be how you should judge him. I'm going to say that one more time. The way his content has impacted you should be how you judge him. Now, there are people out there who were buying his supplements thinking, I can look like this guy naturally just using these supplements and working out who obviously didn't end up looking like that. And there are people who listened to what the Liver King said and thought, you know what, I'm just going to get my lazy fat ass up and hit the gym a little bit. So I believe that he's positively impacted millions of people. But the thing is with the internet, everything you hear on the internet, you need to take with a pinch of salt. Everything besides the words of Tristan and Andrew Tate. Because for me and my brother, integrity is something that we do not compromise on. We've never compromised on it. Uh, my brother was accused of being on steroids by, uh, not accused, it was a subject brought up by a, a guy who we know, more plates, more dates, and Andrew said, feel free to come and fucking test me. You know, our integrity isn't in question because we have no skeletons in our closet. So I don't really care about the Liver King. I think he's helped a lot of people. I think a lot of people feel hurt and feel scammed by him right now. What I would say is this. If you are going to ever pursue a career in the public eye, if you are making content hoping to go viral or hoping to blow up, it may well happen at some point. I'm not sure the Liver King expected to get as famous as he did. I certainly didn't expect to get as famous as I did. But the key to mine and Andrew's lasting and ongoing success is the fact that we have no skeletons in our closet. So be honest all the time, especially if you're pursuing a life in the public eye. When you watch people on the internet, you know, there are lots of people who have had very bad skeletons in their closet from the Reverend Ted Haggard to True Geordie and so on. Daz Black being another one. You know, don't believe what you hear on the internet. So I don't know how the Liver King is going to repair his reputation with his fans. I don't know how he's going to repair his reputation with you. Maybe you like him, maybe you hate him. I didn't ever watch any of his content and I never bought any of his supplements. So I personally have nothing against him. 
So, you know, I wish his fans all the best, but it was kind of obvious that uh, he took something to enhance his, his body. I mean, I, I, that's what I would think. Lots of Super Chats coming in already. Now, I'm not sure if I should... I wasn't going to talk about this, but now I am going to talk about it. I've got a lot of controversial subjects because people are asking my opinion on a lot of controversial topics. And these are topics that I've usually avoided. I've avoided them on platforms like the previous one, Cucktube, that I was on. Because I understand that it's very easy to be misconstrued and taken out of context when discussing very sensitive issues. So, with that in mind, I'm going to dive right in here. Hey, Tristan. I know you are a biracial man. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on Disney casting the new Ariel Mermaid as a black woman. And the room goes silent, talking on the internet about race issues. I am going to tell you what I think about Disney cast casting the new Ariel from Little Mermaid as a black woman. Oh, messages are popping up on my phone. Don't talk about it, right? Let me put my phone down. I'm going to say, how dare you, Disney? How dare you cast Ariel as a black woman? I think for a company that prides itself in imagination, that is the least imaginative thing you could possibly do. Now, wherever you think I'm going with this, you're going to be wrong. So sit back and listen up. I think that if you hired a bunch of movie makers who had never seen The Little Mermaid before and said, all right, guys, we're going to make a show about a mermaid who lives under the sea, who's half human, and they went off and animated or, or hired or cast a black actress or made the character black and said, here we go, we're finished with the movie, you could say, oh, uh, well, in my mind, she was white and redhead. But yeah, cool. Fair enough mistake. Cool. You hired an actress. You know, good for you. Cool. Let's run with the movie. But that's not what happened, is it? What happened is a bunch of executives at Disney sat around at a table and said, I have a good idea to represent black people. Let's make Ariel black. Let's take a character who is historically white and redheaded. Forget about the little redhead girls who like having a Disney princess that they can look up to. Let's turn this character black. Because that will make black people feel good. Now, I am a multiracial, biracial man. My father was black. My mother is white. And I can't speak for all black people. But I can speak as a mixed race man with a black nephew. Uh, and say, I think that is the laziest, most pathetic excuse for representing black people on, on modern day television. Let me tell you something. We're going to role play something. In the 1980s, they did it right. They did representation on television the right way. In 1982 or 1983, an executive walked into an office at an American television studio and said, listen up, guys, we don't have enough black people on television. And the executives and the producers all sat around and said, you know what, you're right, we don't have enough black people on, t on television. I have an idea. What we'll do is we'll create a sitcom, a sitcom that doesn't, portray black characters in a negative way. Let's have the father be a judge, uh, the, the mother be a lawyer, the, 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 the daughter be a television presenter, the son be a straight A student, and let's cast Will Smith as a character who is living in an upper class, well-to-do black family, but still struggling with some of the issues that modern day black teenagers deal with. Let's call it the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, let's not portray black people in a negative light, and let's do something positive for the black community by making this show. And the executives sat around and discussed it, and they thumbs up it and signed it into reality, and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, one of my favorite shows when I was a kid, was born. The Cosby Show, exactly the same. They sat around and said, let's make a proud, well-to-do black family and put them in front of everybody on the television every single day without portraying black characters in a negative light. That is how you do black representation on television. What you do nowadays, Disney executives and Netflix executives who are listening, is you are lazy and you are not treating the issue seriously. 
Today, 2021, 2022, a television executive runs to the door and says, guys, Netflix, we don't have enough black people on television. What do we do about this? And you dummies sit around and go, um, black Vikings? And you all cheer and say, yeah, black Vikings, wonderful idea. Let's make Vikings black. It's an insult to Norse history. It's an insult to European history. It's an insult to black history. It's not factually correct. And it doesn't help black people. It is lazy. And one of you clowns at Disney sat around when the executive said we need more representation of black people on television. And you went, uh, you know the Little Mermaid? Uh, there's been like 20 movies with her in it. Uh, she, she's a character at every Disney theme park. And she's a white woman with red hair. Um, why don't we just make her black? And you patted your, yourselves on the, black, on the back and said, well done. You've done your bit for black people. You should be ashamed of yourself. That is the least imaginative way to help black representation I've ever heard of. And it's not just that. I see it all the time. I was watching a movie recently, and I had to turn it off halfway through. Mary, Queen of Scots. It was set in, uh, during the reign of Elizabeth I in England when there were no black people in England. Keep in mind, the first black man ever to live in London was a historical figure. His name was Cornelius, and he didn't move to London until 50 years after Mary, Queen of Scots, was set. Where's the movie about Cornelius? You want to make movies with black people in it set in medieval England? Make a movie about him. Make a movie about his life story. What you don't do is take a time period that had no black characters and cast a whole bunch of black actors. I'll tell you why. Because I don't want my young black nephew watching Mary Queen of Scots thinking, well, in the 1500s, we were advisors to the queen and generals to armies. No, you weren't. No, black people weren't. And white people teaching that they were is a way of getting rid of the guilt that they carry. And it's absolute nonsense. It's, it is a lazy attempt at casting black people in modern day television. If you think of some of the black people in history, I, I actually got this up. I'm going to read the full title out. In 1861, a slave named Robert Smalls stole a Confederate ship and delivered it to the Union Army. He was given command of the ship. He became a major general, bought the house where he was a slave, and let the former owner's wife live there when she developed dementia. He learned how to read and write and won an election against a white man and served five years in Congress. Where is the movie about Robert Smalls? Where is the movie about Robert Smalls? You don't make one. What you'll do is you'll make a movie about Vikings and turn them black. It's insulting and it's lazy. What's his name? Ashuga. Is it Ashuga or Ashuka? I believe he was a black slave sold by a Portuguese merchant vessel to Japanese men who set him free, and he became a samurai warrior in feudal Japan. A black African man. Where's the Netflix series about him? Animated or non-animated? That would be a fucking killer of a show. Make the series. There's a job for a black actor. But what you don't do, and what you, the BBC did this, is take a classic story like the story of Troy, where Achilles is described in the original text as a fair-skinned man with long blonde hair, and make the actor black. You don't take Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's wife, who was a white woman, and make the actress black. It's lazy and it's insulting. As a mixed-race man, it offends me. So no, I don't think that The Little Mermaid should be black. What I think Disney should do, if you are so imaginative and filled with imagination as you claim you are, is create a new princess. Maybe a princess in feudal Africa. Maybe make a story about black characters and include more black people. Don't just blackwash your characters. It's lazy and it's stupid and I personally can't stand it and black people shouldn't stand for it either. You should go to a movie where they make the Vikings black and walk out and say, why are they putting black people in the Vikings movies. My kids are gonna think that we were Vikings. It's absolutely ridiculous. But I will give a quick honorable mention to people who do make movies and TV shows and cast all black cast. People like Jordan Peele. I watched a movie recently. It was called uh, Us. It was a horror movie by that director, Jordan Peele. And I have, I've sat around with my black friends. I'm mixed race myself. I know I look super white. For all the comments, I know I look super white. Um, I'm mixed race myself. I sat around with my black friends talking about horror movies. And they're like, ah, yeah, that's white people shit. The house is haunted. 
I'd act like this, I'd act like that. You know, to actually watch Us, which was a movie directed by, by Jordan Peele, which was a horror movie uh, starring a black family and, and a bunch of other black actors, it was a wonderful movie because it was an original story. Great that he cast an all-black cast because why shouldn't you? It's not a movie that's being redone. It's not a plot that should involve white people. It's a plot set in the United States and, you know, 13, 14% of Americans are African-American. And it was hilarious. The way that they behaved in the horror movie was actually different from the way white people behave, analyzing their body counts, etc. And it was a great movie. For, so shout out to great directors like him. But, you know, when I hear they're trying to make James Bond black, I mean, the 007 in the latest one, I know it's not James Bond, but with some black woman, I'm like, just write new characters. Write new black characters and make the movies great. There's no need to do this. And black people should demand more from companies like Disney. That's what I think about The Little Mermaid being black. So, um, long answer, I know. Did my cigar go out? Ah, all the people who warned me against speaking up against that are saying that was a very good answer. What did you think I was gonna say? You think I'm some white supremacist? I'm mixed race. Oh, and during my last stream, a few complainers complained about me uh, smoking my cigar or relighting my cigar too often and taking up too much time. To that, I would say, don't fucking watch me then. It's a cigar night. That's the whole idea behind this. I'm smoking. So I'm going to get my cigar going and I'm going to move on to the next point I was going to talk about today. Because I have hundreds of questions from hundreds of interesting people. I'm gonna start reading some names out as well. Hey Tristan. Hours ago, Russia freed WNBA star Brittany Griner in a prison swap with the US, releasing a Russian arms dealer, Victor Bout. I believe that was the guy who um, Gods of War, the movie Gods of War with Nicolas Cage was about. So um, what do I think about Brittany Griner being released? I think that Russia have proven, once again, that they are smarter than the United States. Brittany Griner is a criminal. She carried marijuana, and en enough to distribute, who cares if she was gonna smoke it all herself, into Russia, which has very strict drug smuggling laws. I'm here in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and you hear stories out here. Oh, this guy was caught with just one bag of Coke, and he did six years you hear stories like this in Thailand, where I used to live. I heard of an Australian DJ, young kid. He was, um, I think all the politicians got involved. He was found with 70 ecstasy pills, and they gave him one year in jail for every pill. Now, people love to cry when stuff like this happens. There have been people crying about Brittany Griner this entire time. To which I say, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. You have to understand that it is a unique form of arrogance to believe that every country has the exact same rules, moral standards, as you do in your country. To think, oh, you know, I play basketball and I love smoking weed. I'm just going to bring some weed to Russia. You know, it's just weed. The Russians don't see it that way. The Thais don't see it that way. The Arabs do not see it that way. I would have been perfectly happy for that woman to stay in jail for the rest of her natural life or however long the Russians see fit because it is none of America's business how Russia conducts its criminal justice system. I don't care if she was an American citizen. And if I was in, if a friend of mine was in Russia smoking weed and got locked up for 10 years, I'd be the first one on this stream saying, my friend, this guy who you know I associate with is actually a dumbass. So, you know, I hear all the bad stories all the time of the UAE or Thailand and people say, oh, it's unfair how they treat people. If you know the laws of a country, do not permit your behavior that you do back home, then do not go to said country. Snoop Dogg. Shout out to Snoop Dogg. Because I know people here in the UAE who are talking about bringing him here for concerts and appearances. And Snoop Dogg quite rightfully said, listen, man, I got to smoke, man. I can't come. Got to smoke. Need my weed. That's my Snoop Dogg impression. You can rate my Snoop Dogg impression in the comments section out of 10. And he said, no, I'm not coming because I like to smoke my marijuana. Bravo, Snoop Dogg. Because he's obviously 
an intelligent man. Because you know what a dumb man would have done? Yeah, sure, I'll come to the UAE, give me my paycheck. If I just bring one bag of weed, they won't mind. And he would have ended up in a Middle Eastern jail for 20 years. And people would have, dumb people, would have been like, oh, poor Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg's got a brain. Snoop Dogg is like, no, I'm not going to these countries where I can't smoke my marijuana. I like my marijuana. And fine by them. I would happily go to a country where you couldn't smoke cigars or drink alcohol. If that was the rules of the country, I'd go and visit and I'd lay off the booze and I wouldn't smoke a single cigar and I'd leave and do my stuff back home. So what do I actually think about this woman? I think that Russia got a fucking whale of a deal by getting back their dangerous arms dealer and we got back some idiot who can't resist weed so much that she bought a bunch on a plane to Russia. So, I mean, well done to Russia. I mean, that, that's all I can say. Enjoy your arms dealer back. Oh, don't worry, we have a WNBA star. As though anyone watches the WNBA anyway. Who knew who Brittany Griner was before this happened? Yeah, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. So, shame on the United States. You know, when there are still people like Joe Exotic in jail and we're, we're doing deals for Russian arm dealers, to release, you know, a woman who clearly violated a foreign country's drug laws. Um, I think that's uh, a total scam. So, Bikism MGH on Twitter asks, and I'm going to give you context in a moment if you don't know what this question is about. Tristan, I have an idea. You're building a castle next to Dracula's castle. Build a hotel. A hotel would do wonderful business and a hotel would be amazing. So for those of you who don't know, I am building a castle in Romania, about 900 meters away from Dracula's historic castle, up on the hillside behind him. And the reason I'm building that castle is because I think that rich people are boring. Rich people are boring. Rich people want to go to the ski slopes, hire a bunch of hookers, sniff a bunch of cocaine, sit on a boat with a bunch of cocaine and a bunch of hookers. And I don't understand why they all do the same thing. I have decided to build a gothic castle in the heart of Transylvania because I want a castle. Doesn't every boy want a castle? You know, that part of me never died. I have the money. I have the, the means to do it. So I am building a castle. Now, this question specifically is somebody asking, why don't I make my castle a hotel? And I'm going to answer you exactly why I don't. One reason is I promised the local mayor that I wouldn't. There are lots of hotels around the area of Dracula's castle. It's a small village of a population of only 5,000, and the local people run their hotels and they control the tourism and the commerce. I have promised not to make my castle a hotel because I don't want to take any business or any money away from the local people. But two, and most importantly, get your own fucking castle. Oh, you want me to make it a hotel? So I can spend $15 million in four years of stress building an epic castle. And for a few hundred bucks a night, you could come along and run around it and take your Instagram pictures. No, no access. Get your own. I'm going to have armed guards armed with crossbows in full armor patrolling the castle walls with rabid dogs inside ready to tear intruders apart. It is mine. That's why I don't want to make it into a hotel because I don't need anyone's fucking money. I don't need a thousand bucks a night, two thousand bucks a night. Oh, you want to have your wedding there? You want to shoot a music video there? How about build your own castle? Because mine is for me. I want to walk around butt naked, swirling a huge glass of brandy with, with five vampire girls all dressed up with their fangs on and shit. I don't even know what I'm going to do. I don't even know what I'm going to do. But I'm going to do it, not you. So no, my castle is not going to become a hotel. I would never do that. So never ask me that again, because I am furious. I thought this was an interesting one. I have two history-related questions here. Actually, I have three. So let me try to find them all and lump them all together. Johannes, R.I.P. Johan, said on Twitter, What are your thoughts on history? Do you care about the history of the world, like World War I and World War II, etc.? Do you think that learning history is important? Or don't you give a fuck about it? I actually, in my spare time, for entertainment, read history books. I love history documentaries. I don't know how many books on history I've read. I know world history 
better than a lot of people who are educated in world history. It's one of my main passions. So I'm going to move from that question onto if you could go back in any period of history, which one would you choose to visit and why? And that is a question from Petrucci999 on Twitter. I have two answers to that question. My answers are as follows. It depends on what go back in time means. If I could go back in time for a few days and I had to blend in, be a member of the public, not get killed, that answer is very different from what I would do if I could just go back in time in an invisible ship and fly around and watch what was happening. So I'm going to answer the invisible ship question first. If I could go back in time to any period in time in an invisible ship and watch what was going on, I would watch the battles of Napoleon Bonaparte in Europe in the late 1700s and early 1800s. I would watch the Battle of Austerlitz in the modern day Czech Republic and just see how the whole thing played out actually in person. No recordings of it obviously ever happened. All we have are the written accounts. I would just love to see that. I think that would be an experience like no other. If I had to blend in though, I wouldn't go back to the Battle of Austerlitz because people wouldn't know what fucking language, the people would think, no, I'm a spy or a traitor from England. Probably speaking some weird dialect because I don't speak like people did back in the 1800s. And I would probably be shot on the spot. And if I wasn't shot on the spot, I wouldn't want to fight for either the French or the, the Russian army because that would just suck. So if I had to blend in, what I would do is I would go back to the opening of the Colosseum in ancient Rome, dressed like a normal Roman citizen or villager, and get my way into the Colosseum and watch the gladiatorial games in silence. I believe that I could do that without getting murdered, hopefully. And I think that watching the gladiatorial games would be an experience, again, unlike no other. Fighters, boxers, you know, I've been to all sorts of events. It's the modern day combat sport. But yeah, that was really brutal and ruthless. And I think most men, if you're honest, you'd like to see that. You wouldn't like it to happen today uh, because I wouldn't want anyone pitted against another man in you know, mortal combat for somebody's entertainment. I think that would be immoral. But the fact that it happened anyway in the past, if I could go back and actually watch it and view it myself, I would watch it. Uh, I guess the closest thing that exists today is, is bullfighting in Spain. In fact, bullfighting in Spain, if you didn't know, is actually a hangover from the Roman Empire. It's not something that's uniquely Spanish. Um, it's a hangover from the days of the Roman Empire where people used to fight beasts. And that's why you still have bullfighting in Spain today. Would I go and watch that? Uh, not really. I kind of feel sorry for the bulls. You know, I feel like at least make it fair, give the bulls an opportunity to kill the matador and actually win. That would be more interesting. But yeah, I'd go back to ancient Rome and watch the gladiatorial games and the gladiatorial combat. I think that would be amazing. And my last history related question, Clayton, is why do you always talk like a time traveler from the 1800s? I don't think I do talk like a time traveler from the 1800s. I think you need to get a time machine and go back to the 1800s and realize that I don't sound anything like them. But maybe I am a time traveler from the 1800s. Maybe that's why I'm building a vampire castle. Maybe I am the living incarnate of Vlad Sepesh Dracula and I'm building a castle to reestablish the kingdom of Transylvania to its former glory and I'm going to go to London and start terrorizing people and biting them, etc., etc. But no, that's definitely not the case. So, do I move on to more touchy subjects like black mermaids? I think I do. I think I do. Hey, Talisman. What are your thoughts on going to college to learn about digital marketing? Is it worth time going? Would you start off yourself by learning and make some mistakes before getting educated or would you not bother going to university at all? That's from uh, having a stroke RN on Twitter. Unusual name. University. Here's my problem with university. University has complete and utter control on the business of lending money to young people.
Let's say you're 18, and you and four of your 18-year-old friends have been going around your neighborhood washing cars. You've proved that you're hardworking. You've proved that your business model is viable, and you've made $5,000 washing cars. You're living off this salary. You have ads in the paper, and your business is going well. And you all go to the bank, and you say, hello, bank. They say, hello, young 18-year-old men or women. I would like to borrow some money to expand my car washing business. I have a perfect business plan. The business is already making money. I'm paying my taxes. It's all legit. I'd like to rent a premises here at this busy intersection and expand and take my car wash business to the next level. The bank will say, no, I don't trust you with $50,000. Kiss my ass. You cannot have a loan until you're 40 years old. 18 year olds get lost. Screw your car wash business. Leave me alone. If you are a young man whose grandfather or father ever gave them flying lessons in a small plane, and you've done a certain number of hours in a small plane, and you go to a bank and say, hey bank, I'm 18 years old. I would love to become a pilot. I feel like that would be a wonderful career for me. I've done this many hours flying in a small plane. What I need is some commercial airline training. So in a couple years, I can apply for jobs at American Airways. That would be, that's my dream. Can you please lend me $50,000, even paid directly to a flying school, so I could finish my training as a pilot and I can go and fly aircraft? They'll say, oh, that sounds very interesting. No, get lost. You can't have a loan and you can't be a pilot. If you want to be a pilot, join the military and risk dying in one of our pointless wars. Before I go off on a tangent, I'll silence myself. Then if you survive our pointless war, you can have a pilot's license. Uh huh. Ridiculous, but they will not lend you money. Whereas, unlike the young focused man who wants to become a pilot, unlike the young focused individuals who are running the car wash and making good money and paying their taxes, if a lost young man, straight out of high school with very basic grades, doesn't know what he wants to do in life and approaches a loan center attached to a university and says, hi, I have no clue what I want to do. I'm just some kid. My grades are average. I have no real aspirations. But I think university or college is the next step. I want to study gender studies. They'll write you a big fat check for $100,000 that you know, you now, have to go out with your gender studies degree and find a way of paying back. And you are in debt and enslaved by the matrix forever. Higher education has a monopoly on the financial system lending money to young people because they will only get loans for higher education. <sighs> if you want to learn internet marketing, you do not go to university. There are use cases for university. If you want to be a lawyer, good, go past the bar. You want to be a doctor, cool, go to medical school. If you want to learn internet marketing, you do not need to go to university and get that big $50,000 check which you then have to pay back with your internet marketing skills because people out there on the internet have created platforms that aren't unfairly biased towards young people that can teach you skills to make money. Now, of course, I'm going to talk about the real world or the evolution of Hustlers University 2.0. It's a program put together by my brother and myself, it is a very, very unique system where we made sure that verified millionaires are giving lessons on how to make money in the field that made them rich. Before you go to university to study gender studies, before you go to university to study business, what I would advise you to do is this. Go to the faculty parking lot and say, what does this teacher teach? What does this teacher teach? And point out all the vehicles. The crappiest cars out there will be the business studies teachers. So if this guy's so broke he can't even buy a nice car, why is he telling you about business for $100,000 a year? That's called a racket. It's called racketeering. It's a scam. Whereas if I lined up all the vehicles of my real world professors, you'd be very impressed. From Rolls Royces to Lamborghinis to G-Wagons. Now, the real world, is only $149 to join and a recurring $49 a month. There's a link underneath this video. It is the best 
and now the biggest educational platform outside of a traditional university that exists in the world. It's the biggest educational platform in the world that isn't a traditional university. And the reason is, is because it works. So check it out, join on the link below. But traditional university, yeah, it's, it can be a scam unless you're very specific about what you wanna do in life and very specific about where you wanna go, you have no business just signing up to university and borrowing a bunch of money. Even in countries where it's free, you'll learn a lot more in those three years working for businesses, trying to start your own business, than you will listening to some broke professor talk to you about business. Because in the countries where university is free, the professors are typically more broke than the other professors. And who wants to learn from broke people? Not me. So those are my thoughts on going to college. You're welcome having a stroke right now. I hope you mean a stroke as in like the one that you die from, not the other type of stroke. Otherwise, I wouldn't have answered your question. Ah. Jimmy James Jamil Jackson on Getter. If you're not on Getter, get on it. It's a wonderful social network. There's a link to my Getter account just below this profile. It says, hey, G, what if a girl has a body count of one but has slept with the same guy hundreds of times and she's still high value? Uh, the answer to that question is yes, of course, if she has a body count of one, if she slept with one man. You don't count the physical number of times a woman has had sex. That's a very stupid question, but I put this one up on purpose because I want to talk a little bit about female body count. Now, you've heard all of the arguments. You've heard, of course, female body count matters a lot. And you've heard the argument that it's always mattered because it was the only way to guarantee paternity. You know, if a woman's only slept with you, you know, the kids are yours before the days of DNA tests, etc. That's something that my brother says a lot. I heard a very interesting uh, analogy by Patrick Bet David about female body count, talking about job applications, saying if someone came to you to apply for a job and you saw that they've had one job for the past five years, you're much more likely to hire them and know that they take their job seriously than if someone comes to you and they've had 160 jobs in the last five years. That was a very good analogy also. So speaking about body count, I'm just gonna add something that perhaps you haven't heard to the mix. And because it's, it's an argument and a point that I think I have made up. I'm not sure anyone has said it before. So it's a unique Tristan Tate take on body count, despite the stupid question has led me into this. So let me do a little bit more smoking. That middle finger, of course, was for all the people thinking, why am I sitting watching Tristan Tate relight his cigars? Because I'm so passionate about the things that I speak about that I accidentally get sidetracked and my cigar starts to go out as excellent of a cigar as it is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about female body count with an argument you perhaps haven't heard before. I believe that women with high body counts, and I'm not just talking about high body counts, because obviously a 35 year old woman has slept with more men than a 18, 19 year old, old women, old woman. I'm talking about res as respective to their age, you know, if a woman who's 30 says she slept with seven men, you know, it wouldn't phase you. If a woman who was 16 said she slept with seven men, you'd be like, whoa. So here's why female body counts matter. Because I believe a woman with a high body count is not capable of loving you and respecting you and appreciating you as much as a woman with a low body count. And as we know, love and respect and appreciation goes both ways. If a woman really loves, respects, and appreciates you, you can really love, respect, and appreciate her back because that's what we look for in women, love, appreciation, and respect. Now, when I say women with high body counts aren't capable, I really do mean it. So I'm gonna give you an ana analogy that I made up because I made it up two days ago and I'm sure you've never heard before. I'm gonna to talk to you about a friend of mine. His name is Alex. He's my personal trainer, my physiotherapist. Alex doesn't drink, almost never. He's got six pack abs, he walks around looking good all the time. Doesn't like alcohol, doesn't drink alcohol, knows alcohol's bad for his health. The other night, I was celebrating a very big business milestone that myself and my brother had passed. And without saying anything, 
Alex was sitting there with us, slamming shots of tequila all night. And I thought, you know what? Alex is proud of me, and Alex appreciates my friendship, and he is really genuinely happy for my success. The fact that this guy, who doesn't drink, is sitting here drinking vodka shots with me and my scumbag friends, means a lot to me. It's special. He's doing something he doesn't normally do to show his appreciation for me. That's a good friend. Now let's imagine there's another guy who gets drunk every day by himself. will drink a bottle of vodka. If anyone in any bar in any pub offers him a drink, he'll take it and sit there and drink with him. A homeless dude, for example. And I somehow convince this homeless guy to come and celebrate my business milestone with me. And he's sitting there slamming my tequila. Why is that less meaningful? I know he doesn't appreciate me, respect me, care about me as much as a real friend. Because this guy will drink with anybody. Do you see where I'm going here? I hope you do. If a woman has had one serious boyfriend in her life, say she's 21 years of age, and has a, a body count of one, which I think is very low, and you were to meet her at 21, if you charm her, wine and dine her, seduce her, make her really feel something for you, there's a good chance she'll be your girlfriend, she'll have sex with you, and you may well end up getting married and bearing children and all the beautiful things that come with um, you know, male-female relationships. However, if you, if you meet a girl who's 21 who has a body count of 300, sure, she'll fuck you. But that sex doesn't mean she cares about you. It doesn't mean she appreciates you. It doesn't mean she respects you. In fact, it's meaningless because it's not you that makes her do it. It's the sex. Just like it's the drink that will make the homeless man accept my invite, not my achievements. So be very careful of women with very high body counts. Be very careful of women who say that it doesn't matter because I feel like they can't appreciate and love and respect a man in the same way that a woman with a low body count can. So... I have met loads of women with high body counts, and I've slept with plenty of them. I'm not going to pretend I haven't, and so have many of you watching at home. But to all the women out there who do have high body counts, let me tell you something. Before you start saying, Tristan Tate, oh, he's just a fuckboy, or this guy's just a fuckboy, or this guy, he just uses women. You allowed yourself to be used by every single, body, every single person in your hometown. Nobody is going to treat you, even the man who wants a family and wants a serious relationship and wants love and wants the real deal, he's not going to treat you the same way because of the way you've treated yourself. It's nothing to do with how men are behaving towards you. It's how you've behaved towards yourself. So yeah, it really does matter. And when that love and respect and appreciation isn't sent my way, I won't send it back. I'll call them a taxi in the morning. I'll be polite. I'll give them a kiss on the cheek. But that's it. So body count really does matter. And that's an interesting analogy, I think. And it's something that I made up. So feel free to, you know, take that home, tell everyone about it, walk around, repeat it. Make sure you credit me, though, because I'm a genius, of course. Now we're going to get tricky. Anonymous question on Getter. Hi, Tristan. What are your views on abortion? <laughs> and the room goes silent. Ah, this is another black mermaid, isn't it? Watch my phone's going to start blowing up from people watching live saying, ooh, don't talk about abortion. Well, you know what? I am going to talk about abortion. Because the reason this person is asking the question, previously in the question, they say, I've noticed when you and Andrew talk about the de degeneracy of the West and how cultures are degenerating, you talk about women who have lots of abortions. So they're wondering if I am pro or anti-abortion. And I think I'm going to upset both camps right now, which is unique. Because a lot of people on the internet would try to give an answer that makes both, both camps happy. I am going to give my unique perspective. And I like to think that the way that my mind works is slightly different from most people's. So my perspective is quite different from most people's. So I'm going to give an answer that perhaps you haven't heard. And an argument that perhaps you haven't heard. And an argument that's going to offend the pro-choice camp. And an argument that's going to offend the pro-life camp. And I'll start by saying that from a legal standpoint, in terms of the laws of a country, I believe abortion 
should be legal. This comes with a huge series of buts. So listen up. I understand that women in prison, maybe it's in their, the child's, or maybe not the child's, their and society's interests to make abortions available to women in prison. If you are a homeless woman addicted to heroin, I believe it may be in the woman's interest and society's interest to allow women like that to have abortions. So I do think it should be legal because I do think there are some, some cases, obviously rape, incest, all the normal stuff, where for society and for the woman, the option should exist. Now, to attack the pro-choice camp, which is the camp that I really can't stand. Because I don't understand why people pretend that abortion is something that it's not. This is what makes me sick about the pro-choice camp. I have just said that I don't think it should be illegal. I believe there are some cases where it's justifiable, even. But the way the pro-choice camp talk, you animals, is as though it's no big deal. It's a big fucking deal. What I won't hear and what I don't like listening to is people saying it's not murder. People saying it's just a clump of cells. People saying until it can exist on its own, it's part of the mother. People who saying, oh, I've had loads of abortions, it's fine. People making... Jokes about abortion, I don't find funny. It is the murder of a human being. I don't care if you think it's a part of the mother. I don't care if it can survive on its own. There are full-grown adults who can't survive on their own. I am just as much a clump of cells as a newly conceived fetus. The fact that the fetus's DNA code is unique means that it is a unique person, for one. There are people born with no arms and no legs who are just as much a human being as me or you. So to look at the stages of development of this unique DNA code and say, oh, it doesn't matter because it hasn't developed this or it hasn't developed that is actually sickening. I don't understand why people can't have a normal attitude towards abortion. It's either it should be illegal in all cases, even if she's nine year old and her uncle raped her, or Oh, it's completely fine and it's completely harmless to society and abortion should be readily available on every high street. I don't understand why it's so polarized. Why can't people say it should be legal because some people need it, but it is absolutely disgusting and it is murder and it is abhorrent. Yeah, I just don't get it. So the pro-choice people are going to be mad at me because I've called them all a bunch of animals because their arguments, quite frankly, disgust me and their behavior disgusts me. And the fact that normal, healthy people with normal jobs, uh, with functioning bodies and no drug habits will go out and get abortions makes me want to throw up. They'll be mad at me. And the pro-choice people will be mad at me. So uh, the pro-life people will be mad at me because I said that there are some cases where it should be. Okay, so my perspective is kind of unique. But it was a personal and I think interesting question with an interesting answer. So I thought I'd give it. To reiterate, I don't see any universe where somebody like me, who chooses willingly to have sex with a woman and she falls pregnant, should have the option to abort the baby. Now, legally, can the option exist? Sure, the, the legal option can exist within the country I live in. I have no problem with that. But why can't I be my own moral arbitrator? Because no woman who gets pregnant with me is going to have an abortion. I assure you, that is not going to happen. I'm a young, healthy, smart, intelligent millionaire. My kid could become the next president of the United States for all I know. You're not aborting that to pursue some career or because you don't like the way it will make your body look. That is disgusting. So those are my personal views on abortion. To summarize, I'm against it for myself. Me and healthy, able-bodied people should be the moral compass for themselves and be against it themselves. And I think if everybody thought that way, you'd have a lot fewer abortions. And also people should just make smarter, more informed choices with who they have sex with. Because I've heard this, Tristan, what if you get some crackhead pregnant? I wouldn't have sex with a crackhead. 
So what universe is that going to happen? Absolutely stupid argument. Charbel911. How can I deal with negative people and change them to become more positive? Ah, oh, interesting question. I would say, unless you owe a moral duty to that person, by which I mean, unless that person is your mother or your father or somebody who has helped you or somebody who has coached you or somebody who has taught you, don't go around trying to fix broken people. A mentor of mine has a saying, I don't fix broken birds. And what he means by that is, if you don't succeed, the bird's going to die in your hands anyway. And if you do, it's just going to fly away. Broken people are broken people for a reason. I understand certain levels of effort if you owe them, you know, if you have a sense of moral obligation towards them. But if you don't, then honestly, don't waste your time trying to fix broken people. There's, there's, no, there's no hope for a lot of people in the world. And a lot of people in the world are never going to make it and they're never going to escape the mindset that keeps them in the matrix. I'd network with better people. Obviously, things like the real world exist. Organizations such as the War Room exist. There should be links to that on CobraTake.com. You know, check those out. There are networks of people out there who are winners, who will be positive, who will strive to do better and inspire you to do better at exactly the same time. And that's it. Cut off the, cut off the negative people. T. Malone. I'm reading this one out because this idea has already been suggested. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the app I'm developing. Hi, Tristan. Your new app idea should be called Checkmate. I understand. So that name has been suggested already before. The name's, of course, taken. But I am developing an app. I'm developing an app that is going to... It's not a catfishing prevention app. It is not a judgmental app to judge people's looks. What it is, is a photo accuracy rating app where people you've interact with, act, interacted with in real life, you'll be able to rate how accurate their photos are, how accurate their body is to the body in their photos, how accurate their face is to the face in their photos, how accurate their age is to the age they look in photos. See, I think that's a very interesting app, how accurate their height is to how tall they say they are or look in photos. Of course, an app like this can be used to prevent catfishing because I believe catfishing to be one of the biggest red flags in the world because it is initially putting your foot in the door and going into a relationship or going on a date with dishonest first intentions. If a woman is 10 out of 10 on a dating app and she shows up and she's an 8 out of 10, she may well still, still be pretty, but she has intentionally tried to deceive you from the first step. If a man on his Instagram profile looks like he has a wonderful, fun lifestyle, he's standing next to Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces, and he turns up and picks you up in a Toyota Corolla because that's all he has, he's intentionally trying to deceive you. And I don't think that is a good premise to start anything serious from. So yes, the new app I'm developing, Checkmate, is a name that has been suggested to me already, um, as well as a bunch of other names. But uh, I will be developing an app that rates photo accuracy. And you'll be able to see the most accurate photos, who looks most like their pictures, the least accurate photos. You may want to call them the biggest catfish if you like, but it's not a catfishing app or an anti-catfish app because that would be mean it would be taken down somehow. It's an app to reward those who take accurate pictures. So this is coming up to the end of the hour. I want to read a little statement about self-analysis. Because <laughs> if there's one thing me and my brother teach and we like to preach is accountability. Now, accountability of oneself comes from the analysis of oneself and one's own actions. I think that is the reason why my brother and I have drawn such a large audience, why 1.5 million people will eventually watch this video of me just sitting down talking, smoking a cigar by myself, no clever idea, no clever gimmicks. Because I believe people actually listen to our content and make positive changes to themselves. So everything I've talked about, you know, 
over the last few months and years, getting in shape, going out there and making money, being smarter, being more intelligent, dealing with people better, handling your relationships better, isn't something that you can learn from me. It's simply me telling you to work on yourself in certain ways. And so many millions of people have written me and my brother and told us about the positive impacts that we've had on their lives. And we really appreciate that. So this is a statement that my brother has sent me that he'd like me to read out to end this cigar meeting live. Millions of people never analyze themselves. Mentally, they are mechanical products of the factory of their environment, preoccupied with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, working and sleeping, and going here and there to be entertained. They don't know what or why they are seeking, nor why they never realize complete happiness and lasting satisfaction. By evading self-analysis, people go on being robots. Conditioned by their environment, true self-analysis is the greatest art of progress. I'm going to leave you guys with that thought. I'm going to finish my cigar downstairs with my friends and probably have a few drinks. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next week.